hardest part is figuring out what you want to master. Focus on your product. Can you tell somebody that they suck? You gotta just go for This is exactly what I want to do for a living. You can't even tell somebody that their breath is fit for life. Um, will you hit that timer for me? That's funny. Thanks, Danny boy. Like, I feel like I'm at the gym with the timer. <laughs> you time yourself at the gym? 100%. Really? Everything's against the clock. Like how? Like what do you do? So if, <laughs> so everything, so before I got introduced to CrossFit, I used to go into the gym and just do some buys and tries, whatever. Yeah. And you don't really go against the clock. You know, you're just kind of like doing your thing, hitting your sets. But what CrossFit really introduced to me was this idea of like racing against the clock. And so they made it a competition. Because you'd want, let's just say, I'm like, hey man, let's do 10 push-ups, 10 squats, 10 times, and let's compete against each other. Yeah. But you got to compete against the clock. And so everything was up against the clock. And that's really where the AMRAP mentality came about because in CrossFit, these workouts called AMRAPs, which is as many reps as possible. Uh -huh. So like right now, we're looking at a clock for the podcast. We're AMRAPing. We're trying to get as much good content as we can in a certain amount of time. Yeah. And so that's why we look at exercises. Like when I started transforming away from just kind of aimlessly going around the gym to be more focused for a shorter period of time with a clock to hold me accountable, that's when the results just took off. Ah. So what you do is like, how many can I do in this amount of time? Yeah, I mean, it could be anything. It could be like, there's four time workouts. Like, hey, I want you to do X amount of work. Do it as fast as you can. Yep. And then if you do it again six months later, I want you to do an even better time. Got it. Right? Got it, got it. Or there's, hey, in 20 minutes, uh, you know, John, I want you to do, in 20 minutes, I want you to do as many uh, sit-ups and runs or whatever as you can. Yeah. And so then you try and calculate how much you get. And then, I don't know, a year or two later, you might redo it and see your progress. Yeah. But everything's always um, quantifiable, which is something I, I really like. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Literally just saying that makes a lot of sense. It's funny because I started working out, it was last February. I've always been super skinny, super hard to put on weight. Like no matter what I did, it felt like it never worked. And I started in February and I'm doing well. I've put on like 10 pounds in the last, you know, almost a year. But um, which I'm super thankful for. I feel really feel great. Big fan of the of working out now. But I'm obviously have a lot to learn. But my trainer comes from a CrossFit background, and she had me do a couple. Like she's like, let's see if you can do 500 meters on the row, 10 push-ups, 20 pull-ups, whatever, and, yeah. and see what your time is, and then we'll try to beat it. She did that, right? And I was like, this is miserable. It is yeah. so hard. But but that hard that 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 push. Is kind of like what I'm striving for in all the different areas of my life, yeah. right? So like against the clock, you know, like mm. I'm trying to get the most out of I can out of, you know, spending time with my family, being present, being focused, things of that nature. But in regards to weight gain, if, just a total side note, if you're not back squatting at least once or twice a week, you're you're missing out on a vital. What's like, back squatting? Like if you don't, if you're not putting a bar on your back yeah. and going all the way down and all the way up, you know, in sets of five, maybe with some tempo, so it's a little slow down, fast up you know, five sets of five heavy, yeah. right? Learn how to do it appropriately, right? But that is by far the king, the king of all weight gains. Like, really? Oh, yeah, for sure. And because why? Because it just adds, where does it add? Oh, the dude, because the stimulus is putting on you, it's this bar is right on your back and it's just, it's just, you know, it's just providing tension across your entire system from yeah. your core to your legs and the muscle groups you're developing are giant. Yeah. And so it transforms everywhere else. I mean, I would highly recommend anybody who's looking to gain size, to back squat at least once a week. Yeah. And then if you really want to step, step it up, try and drink like a half a gallon or a gallon of milk a day. You'll, you'll probably get sick. I wouldn't, <laughs> but you just gotta think, of, but yeah. I mean, if you really want to get crazy, yeah. whole milk. Yeah, because I've been doing shakes. I've been doing two shakes a day. Like if I don't, if I don't work out three times a week, do, or more, do two shakes a day and three meals, I essentially yeah, am gonna yeah. lose weight. But like the thing about it is a lot of people go to the gym and they'll do like, you know, calf raises and extensions and like, that's cool. Like yeah. no big deal. But what I like to think about is what could I do to get the biggest bang for my buck? So yeah. like earlier today, I did something called a thruster. So it's like a all the way squat down the press overhead with a lot of weight. So it's combining a lot of muscles. I'm moving a long range of motion. So it's putting a lot of like, like strain on my body. Yep. So it creates a lot of good results. And so I'd recommend anybody who's looking to get into fitness to start looking into more functional application where it's kind of multi-joint type stuff. Yeah. I'll tell you what, though. The first time I ever did those, like, full body back squats, I the next day I felt like I had the flu. Yeah. <laughs> like, it felt like my body, the squat flu? My body was shutting <laughs> yeah. down. Yeah. It was like, I don't know what the hell that was, but yeah. holy shit.
That's good. Um, so I want to start from the beginning here. I want to um, I want to get into your story a little bit because I, I read a little bit of it and and it's really good. And then I want to talk more about that AMRAP. I like that. And what's funny is I read that your book coming out or just came out uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, which will be yesterday in yeah. Time Warp Land. So your book just came out about that whole um, theory. And yeah. what's funny is I read that that was what your book was called. I know what as many reps as possible means, but just you talking about doing things against the clock and trying to be as efficient as possible made it make a lot more sense. So I want to then get into that at the end, like sure. how that can apply to everyone's life. Of course, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm obviously a big advocate of it. So yeah, it's yeah great. more than happy to dive into that towards the end, whatever you want to do. Great. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Where, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in San Jose? Yeah, so I was born and raised in San Jose, California, the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. I went to um, private school. Mm -hmm. I um, I used to race BMX bikes. I was big into skating. Nice. Then I found football. And then in high school, just partied a lot, had a lot of fun, played sports, but didn't really reach my potential at all. Mm -hmm. um, went to um, a junior college because I didn't get accepted in the college I wanted <laughs> to get into, mm -hmm. which was unfortunate. And when I went to junior college, just woke up. I knew I, you know, there's no more of this kind of, there's no, there wasn't this path that people were pushing me down anymore. This had to be on me to put in the work to get to where I wanted to be. What and, made that change? Um, I showed up to my first day of college, which was junior college. So in high school, you know, I was a popular guy. I was playing sports. I felt cool. And yeah, I didn't get accepted into the college I wanted to and football didn't work out. Uh -huh. So I go to junior college and day one, I show up and it was just a dramatic shift. You know, you go from being this high school kind of yeah. cool guy to new kid that no teacher person could care they can care less about you i think that ruins a lot of, not ruins but like really devastates a lot of young people like when you almost you're a star or too popular too early yeah and then like the real world hits you and you're like oh shit. yeah you're nothing yeah. and so i get there and you know first day we're going around we're asking hey you know my name's john i've been here one year my name is this i've been here three years and then the lady next to me She's like, hi, my name's Mary. I think that was her name. Mm -hmm. And this is my seventh year at West Valley. And that was a junior college at the time. And I just remember just looking at her and saying to myself, man, like, I don't want to be sitting here seven years from now. Yeah. And I could be unless I take control over my life and stop thinking that everybody else could help like kind of float me through it like they did in high school. Yeah. And so I went to the counselor's office, put my stuff together. And I ended up... Uh, applying three more times after that to get into Santa Clara University. Mm -hmm. I didn't get accepted each time until finally my high school transcripts were removed mm -hmm. and then I got accepted. So what's that like, what's that mean? So basically what I thought was, oh, I can go to junior college uh -huh. and work hard for like six months uh -huh. and then get accepted into Santa Clara University where my, where my then um, girlfriend was at. So my wife and I now, and, but six months of hard work at a junior college couldn't make up for four years of kind of slacking off in high school. My uh, grades still so your grades me. were just shit. Yeah. yeah. So then once my grades were kind of exited from the, uh, you know, once you have two years of credits under your belt from college, yeah. they no longer look at your high school. So that's what got me into school. So that was a huge learning lesson for me. At the time, I was also working at the gym. I got super inspired by sales. And I, I had been working the front desk while in high school. And then when I got into college, I started working in the sales department. And that was a really cool experience for got me. Got it. So when you were in high school, like were you, you were popular, was the problem that you were, or not the problem, but was the scenario, I guess, that you were popular and played sports and did that stuff, but you didn't care about actually like trying? Yeah, I just, I don't think I reached my full potential. And it kind of sucks to even talk about that today. Mm -hmm. You know, something I think about every day is, you know, am I, am I reaching my full potential are we getting into our full potential as a company, as a husband, as a father? Yeah. And in high school, like I could clearly say, I didn't reach my full potential. And I what wonder, do you think kept you back from that? I think I was just distracted by by not only things that were outside my control, but I think I was I was distracted by the easy route. I was distracted by just being at my buddy's house on the weekend, yeah. drinking, partying, and I and I was I I wasn't encouraged enough, and I didn't do it internally to go towards the things that were uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, which is normal though. You want to know what's crazy is like, I, because I'm big on like wanting the best, not only for myself, but also like when you start to get a little bit older and you realize how maybe many miss opportunities you missed, you want to go back and 
teach young people how to not do that, right? But I think so much of that is like, it's just part of being young. Like, do you think it's yeah. possible? Yeah, just young and dumb. Like, I mean, I think about, so my wife and I met when we were four, 15 years old as freshmen, mm -hmm. and we're obviously still together. And we used to do some stuff that just was not smart. Like, <laughs> like I would never want my daughter to do that, yeah. you know? Cause you know, she'd sometimes sneak out of her house and her dad wouldn't see, let us see each other. It was just bad. Yeah. But like at the time, you don't really think about it. You know, you're just a kid in love, whatever. Yeah. And as, as a high school student, I wasn't thinking about college. I wasn't thinking about my career path. I was just thinking about where's the party at this weekend? Let's yeah. get to it. Yeah, I just wonder if you can even, I wonder if you can even teach people that age to be more focused or if it's just part of the game like you're supposed to go out and experiment and learn who you are you know i don't know i think it's a little bit of both i, yeah. I do think if someone had came to me earlier and said hey look like you have a lot of potential but you're not reaching your potential yeah. here's ways you can get there maybe but yeah. maybe not maybe i had to learn it for myself so that that first day of junior college is a great example then after that obviously i've had many more examples of just yeah. development and thank god that for whatever reason there's just that voice in your head that kicked in you know, a lot of times, like, it takes way longer than college for people to get that or something has to happen. Or, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And for me, it was really about being with my girlfriend. Like, mm -hmm. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed that all my friends went to San Clay University and I didn't get accepted. It was, yeah. it was embarrassing yeah. because that was the first time in my life that it was, like, very quantifiable that, hey, these people had been on a hardworking track. You haven't. Because before we were all at we were all level playing fields. So we we're all in high school, and sure they might have gotten better grades, but it didn't like reflect socially, right? Yeah. Like no one really cared. Yeah. But when you go to college and your and your parents are asking you, oh, where is Ashley going? She's like, oh, she's going to say, oh, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to West. You know, it just yeah. it became something I had to get my stuff together. Yeah, that's true. And then, so what did you end up um, going to college for? What was your? So I went to college for for a business for uh, business management, and that was when I got to San Quentin University, and at the time. I had been working at the gym. So my schedule looked a lot like uh, I'd go to school in the morning. I'd go work out. Then I'd go sell gym memberships. And at, at the time, gym memberships was great because it was always during peak time. So people got off work. They come to the gym while I was there waiting for them. Yep. And then in the evenings, um, I'd either work on some companies I tried to start. I tried to start a clothing company and different stuff. Nice. Um, or I'd you know, study some more and be with my wife. And then so I continued that throughout, uh, throughout college. And I ended up graduating with a degree in business. And at that point, I had to make a decision. You know, am I pursuing the typical career, or am I going to go off and uh, do something non-conventional? Yeah. And what did you? Because obviously, at that point, you go to school for for that long, and you're kind of like on this conventional path. What What did you end up deciding? Yeah, I mean, that's a great, great question. So. You know, throughout college, I'm sitting there, I'm working at the gym, I'm learning in the evenings from the gym owner. Um, I, I, I used to pick his brain about everything I could. And at the same time, I, I tried my own businesses that ended up failing. We started one called Faded Lifestyles. It was like a clothing company, like for nightlife. Yeah. Didn't work out. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. we tried a few things, didn't work out. But when I was going to graduate, I was interviewing for different jobs. And this is where you talk about, you know, kind of, kind of creating your own path. And yeah. I was interviewing for jobs. And I went to this one job interview and I write about this in the book. I, I really tried my best to look the best I could. Like I really found great pants. I iron them. I, yeah. I like, I was really trying to feel solid mm -hmm. and I go in there and I have a phenomenal interview for a finance position. And before I leave, this woman says to me, she's like, Hey, you did a really great job. I want to um, send you on to the next level of the interview process. And I was like, oh, okay, great. So I'm walking out and she goes, Oh, but one thing, She's like, before your next interview, can you please go out and buy a different suit? And I, and I, I just said, I just looked at her, I was like, huh, and I just left. Yeah. And at that moment in my head, I'm like, this woman, like I'm trying my hardest and yeah. my hardest in a suit and she's judging me based off a suit instead of my criteria, instead of these other things. Because what, what, was, what was wrong with the suit? There was nothing wrong with the suit. It just wasn't, it wasn't like a suit suit. It was like a blazer jacket type no, like of thing. It was like, like classic enough. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, classic. Yeah. Like it wasn't, it was just, I was a broke like college student, <laughs> yeah. right? And but anyways, long and short of it is looking back on that, I called my dad on my way to the car. I'm like, listen, I want to pursue my passion. I want to do what I love for a living. I want to open up a gym. And at the time, I'd had a lot of background because I'd worked there. But I, I think the turning point was this woman kind of um, making judgment based off how I look versus how I could actually perform. Yep. But in hindsight, that's not a good reason to go out and open up a business. You know, I, I opened a business because 
because I had, you know, four years of working at the gym. I found Cross, which I fell in love with, and I ended up opening a small little warehouse and going from there. But that, but that happened to be the turning point that told me, hey, I, I no longer want to pursue this interview process. Yeah. I want to go out and do my own thing. Yeah. And so you were saying that like you kind of were driven in the beginning by like selfish reasons almost, right? Like I don't, I want to work for myself. I want to wear whatever I want to wear, which I think is what a lot of people have kind of as their driving force when they're going to start businesses or go out on their own. And you were saying that you had to kind of switch that before you could be really successful. Yeah. Right? I mean, so when, when I opened our first location, it was 1500 square feet. So like twice the size of this office. Yeah. And you know, we, we started off in a warehouse. I had, I had nothing. Mm -hmm. And I had, because I had tried to start some other companies they weren't successful in college, I lost some money doing that. And so I started this business bootstrapped. And at the time I thought, oh, I'm doing this because I wanna be able to work for myself. I wanna be able to have the hard work pay off, this and that. But in retrospect, what I should have recognized is that before I open up any company now, before we do anything, is do we have this concept of earned confidence? And this is something I talk about a lot because I think it's so important. Before I go to the CrossFit Games, I'd wear a wristband on my on my wrist mm -hmm. that said earned. And what that meant for me is that when I was on the bus and I was getting ready for these crazy competitions, no one gave me anything. Mm -hmm. I earned the right to sit on that bus. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a lot of confidence because it, it had been earned, right? Yeah. Now looking at business the same way, I should have recognized, and I now, I now recognize this moving forward, that before we do anything, I wanna make sure I have the earned confidence from decades of hard work, from being an expert, from being able to do things better than other people to go out and open a business. I shouldn't have thought about, oh, I wanna open a business because I wanna, you know, I'm passionate and I, and I wanna be my own boss. Like, well, that's cool, that's a part of it. Yeah. But let's talk about, hey, should you actually open it? Are you credible and what is your competitive advantage? Yeah. That's what I should have thought about more. 100%. So you think like to young, to young people or to anyone um, thinking about starting a business, that's the question they should be able to answer? I think the question you should ask is, is, is a good time in your life, right? Yep. Um, you know, did you just have a baby, this and that? I mean, it takes a lot of commitment. And, you know, how are you going to win? Yep. Like, if you're going to open up a gym next door to me, in your head, you got to say, hey, how am I going to beat this guy? Yep. He's been doing it for 15 years, you know, da 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 da, -da. And, and so if you could if you could say how you're going to win or, or be successful, then hell yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like starting a clothing company. You know how it goes, yeah. right? Like your competitive advantage, you had this network, you had this opportunity, you had, you know, that gave you a leg up over your competitors who oh, might've sure. tried to start the same way. Yeah, yeah, it's true. No, it's great. I think that's so important. I just think that like there's a, there's a big like entrepreneur thing happening right now. You know, oh, yeah. Whoever wants yeah. to be an entrepreneur. And I think yeah. there's a lot of the like, you know, Instagram uh, quotes and stuff like that about being my own boss and my own CEO and my own, you know, and I think that that stuff's great. But I think a lot of it's really detrimental because people aren't, they're not learning to ask the right questions. Yeah. Right? I mean, I was talking to Gary Vee about this, who's kind of like, the, you know, he's, he preaches a lot of entrepreneurship. But yeah. I mean, at the same time, it's like, there's something alluring and this sexy about this idea of being an entrepreneur. And I get it. Yeah. Like I, I get why it can be sexy. And right now in particular it is. Mm -hmm. But what people don't understand is that there's a lot of people out there who are extremely successful as number twos. Yeah. And you don't have to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to be the number one. That comes with a lot of risk and a lot of liability. And it's only for certain personalities, certain types. Yeah. And, and I think what's important is they need to do some deep soul searching, even though this might sound cool. Yeah. Am I really qualified to go out there and do this? Like, I, I'll give you an example. I love coffee and wine. I like both of them. Yep. I want to start a coffee and wine bar. Yep. But I don't know anything about sourcing coffee, getting wine permits. I don't know anything about it. So like, uh, for now, I'm going to just stay in my lane and keep doing the gym business because even though I'm passionate about it, I'm excited about it, doesn't mean I'm qualified. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, I think it's important, man. It's really important. And it's just important to point people in the right direction because... The other thing that gets me is you can do it. Like you can be an entrepreneur. Absolutely. You can open a business. You can be your own boss and wear t-shirts and whatever you want to do. And it's a really good, fulfilling way to live. But you have to start with the right questions, which like is what you're saying, which is what are you uniquely good at? How are you going to beat out your competition? You know, how are you going to do all these things? Not just, man, I'm going to be so rich and post that shit all over. Yeah. Place. And I would also add another layer. Like there's nothing sexy about putting out on social media that you've been doing grinding it out for a decade or whatever it is so a lot of times you'll see images that and i think this is actually something detrimental through social media i'm curious what's going to happen 10 20 years from now 
but people always want this instant gratification. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned in fitness, I'm sure you have too, is that when you're working out, you don't get results in a day, a week, a month. Mm -hmm. It takes years. And even when you get results, it's not like it stops. You want to keep doing it. Yep. And this consistency piece, I think, is really important. Just like I learned when I was in junior college, six months of hard work can't make up for four years of slacking off. And that goes for any entrepreneur, any person out there. You can't just go out and start a business and think in a month or two months or three months can be successful. It's an ongoing process. It takes a long time. And you can't make up for a decade of, you know, playing, uh, you know, watching Netflix yep. in a month. Yeah. And it's great that you're taking a step forward. Just be just be open and honest with the amount of work that you need to do. That's yeah. all. Yeah, I agree. I'm curious too on long term long term effects because I think that for the history of mankind, people have procra procrastinated and done whatever the equivalent to like watching Netflix is, right? And said, oh, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. The interest interesting thing with Instagram is it allows you to pretend and build an audience around make believe, and then there's no actual. Like you can trick yourself and you can trick people that you are up to something. And yeah. then one day the truth kind of has to come out. And I was talking to Gary about that actually too because he's responsible, I think, for a lot of people becoming entrepreneurs. Right. And he was saying like he thinks it's going to be a devastating end for some people because you've had it, you've built up this audience. You've had it in your Instagram bio. You've told everyone that you're an entrepreneur, that you're business, that you're buying a new car, that you're doing all these things. And one day you're going to have to face the truth and you're going to be working a normal job that you're embarrassed about and it's going to really hurt your sort of identity. Yeah. And that's something that I think is the unique added risk that's coming with this new stuff, you know, but I'm curious to see where it pans out because on the same token, it gives you access to a lot of knowledge and a lot of podcasts and a lot of, <laughs> you know, there's so much good to it. There's going to be so many people that become entrepreneurs and change their lives because of what they just did on their cell phone yeah and didn't go to college and didn't do yeah, it goes stuff. both ways yeah i think there's gonna be a lot of opportunity i mean think about podcasts like they they, they have so much great information these are new technology there's a lot of people that are making business to that yeah and more power to them like i want to watch everybody around me thrive and do well that's yeah. that's cool yeah it's amazing um so then what what'd you do then so you said you're gonna go start a gym now screw this lady you have this 1,200, you said 1,200 square foot? Like 1,500, 15, yeah. Okay, sorry, 15, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I shorted you 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1,500 square foot thing, like you just start grinding it out? Like, yeah, man, I mean, we, got, we, had some, we had some dudes come in and just tag the walls. Mm -hmm. um, like I, didn't, I couldn't really afford paint, so I had some guys just come in and just spray, like they practiced their, anyways, that's a whole different <laughs> yeah. story for another day. But these guys came in and, and really I was just, I was a salesman, I was the coach, I was everything. And I signed a six month lease because the owner of the business, the owner of the building wouldn't give me any longer than that, uh -huh. right? Cause I didn't have any credit. I didn't have anything like that. Yep. And so I signed a six month lease and I told myself in six months, we'd either be bankrupt or we'd be so successful we had to move. Yep. And fortunately for me, we were successful and we moved to the next spot and the next spot. And then as we transitioned on, we hired some great staff and we grew from that location to, you know, uh, more locations in the Bay Area. And then we ended up um, transitioning to corporate wellness, which has been really great for us. And, you know, now we have a great team and, you know, 20 some, some odd locations globally. And a lot of our locations are in Asia and Mexico. It's really cool wow. to, to be a, a global. And just, it really came from, I've learned a lot throughout the process, but the big takeaways I've had is, you know, like there's no substitute for just hard work. Yeah. And hard work is just, it's hard and it's work. Like it's exactly what people think it is. Yeah. Like there's no hack to it. And and then also being honest with yourself, you know, kind of knowing what you're good at and knowing what you're not good at and trying to find really good people around you to help with the areas you're not as good at. Yeah. I think that's been really helpful. And what is like, so just so I can wrap my head around, uh, head a little bit around the business, there's 20 location, 20, yeah. 20 like and there's, change or 20? Well, it's, it's tough because, so we have corporate sites with, um, like Lucas Films, GoPro, Western Digital is a big client of ours, MetLife Insurance. We are in their company globally, different spots, wow. right? So we service their their company. And what do you and, do? Like, how's that work? Yeah, so, you know, when I, when I started the gym, I was all about community. I was all about coaching. I was about giving people guidance and direction. And I think that's really important, just like the reason why you have a trainer. But instead of having just one-on-one, -on -one, let's put in a group setting where you kind of vibe off each other. Yep. And what we started to find was that these relationships that were created in the gym were becoming really strong. And so why couldn't we take that to a company where they're all about creating a synergy between the legal department and the HR department? How can we have them all work out together? 
So that's what we brought in. Uh -huh. uh, in particular, Western Digital has been a huge advocate where we have group classes all day, every day. So Plus they have like a gym in their office. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, all over the place. I mean, all over Asia. We have three locations in Malaysia. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's great. Um, but we're transforming the culture through fitness there and having a coach. Yep. And so that's the corporate side of the business. And then obviously we have gyms open to the public in the Bay Area that are more traditional CrossFit-ish style. Yeah. How cool. Where'd you come up with the idea to tie into corporate companies like that? I mean, there was one day where a gentleman um, proposed to his then girlfriend on the floor of our gym. <laughs> Amazing. And that was when I knew that the community we foster is so strong yeah. that why couldn't we bring that to a company setting, right? It, it breaks down the barriers. You know, anybody who owns a company out there, I would highly recommend, highly recommend working out with your employees because it breaks down the barrier in the hierarchy, yeah. right? You might be the CEO, but if you're doing burpees or whatever next yeah. to the intern, yeah. it sucks for both of you. It sure does. And there's something that happens there where you take off this veil of, of corporate. Yeah. And uh, I think it's very powerful. So that's why we brought it to it. That's yeah. so cool. And then like, did that start with you just coming up with this concept and you went and started pitching it to companies? Basically, I came up with the concept and then I went and I went knocking on some doors. Mm -hmm. I found a company called CH Reynolds in Milpitas, California. And I went there, knocked on their door, said, hey, look, I'll do this for free for you. I just want to test it. I'll come here twice a week at 5 a.m. and I'll do it in your whatever. So I bring the gear. Then after a while, we saw huge demand. They only had like 40, 50 employees. But it was really cool to see that almost all of them were participating. So I'd bring dumbbells and kettlebells. We'd do it in their office twice a week at 6 a.m. or whatever. And from there, it, it just sparked. Wow. And was it one of those things where like you kind of proved it before you charged or? Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm a big advocate of like proving your value. Don't really talk about money too much. Like set up expectations appropriately. Like, hey, for 30 days, we're going to do this. Yep. After that, if we see success, this is what it looks like. Kind of set the tone. Yeah. But go in there and prove value. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm such a big fan of that mentality. You know, I think that's another thing that holds a lot of people back is like they, they think they're worth more than they are before they've done anything. Yeah. You know, and that can really stop you from doing Like if you would have went around and said, I have this great idea. I'm going to get companies to work out, blah, blah, blah. But the price is going to be 5K a month. Right. And everyone's like, I don't, why would I take the risk on this guy yeah. with a couple dumbbells? And like, you never would have got the chance to do it. Yeah. I mean, I learned that at a really young age too. I mean, in college, I used to work at a gym, like I said, and I met with the gym owner every night or not every night, but a lot of nights. And we would ride the elliptical and I just pick his brain about business. And one night I finally got the courage to say to him, Hey, I'd like to own a gym one day. Yeah. And he just looks at me. He's like, like I was expecting like this epiphany moment, like, yes, Jason. Like, he just looks at me. He's like, hey, if you want to be an owner, just start acting like an owner. And he just walked away, right? And I'm like sitting there on the elliptical. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Right? Yeah. And later on that day, I see him just cleaning up the locker rooms, right? And it just, it reinforces this concept that don't wait until you have the title. Don't wait until you potentially have more money. Start acting the way that you want to go. Like, I think a lot of times people want to put the cart before the horse. They say, hey, you know, you need to pay me more and then I'm going to act a certain way. Yeah. Well, you need to start acting a certain way. And then the company has an obligation to start paying you more because you're doing such a great job. Yeah. I think that's what we're talking about with the corporate wellness is that I want to go in there, prove the value and make it so awesome that they're looking forward to, to paying us for yeah, the service. <laughs> that's so true. I think that's a good, like, I, I think I, I really learned that a few years ago where like, that's a life lesson. Like you have to act the way that you want to be right like if it's like i want to be healthy i want to be buff i want to lose weight gain weight i want to make money i want to you have to go out and be that long before it the results occurs. will actually be there and yeah. that's the hardest part you know people usually say well i don't know i mean i've been doing it for a week yeah and i'm not buffer yeah you know i'm not skinnier i'm not whatever like you really got to just live as if you're that until eventually life catches up yeah for sure yeah such a good point um my other question is like, how did you, you know, the gym space is super crowded. Yeah. CrossFit, especially super popular. A lot of people are doing it. What do you think separated you being so successful? Well, I mean, earlier on in my career, some people would make the argument and I, I see where th it is valid that, um, you know, I won the CrossFit games. Yep. So that did help uh, with brand recognition, things of that nature. And then I competed at the highest level there for the next, you know, eight years. Yep. And so that helped. But I would say it was really just this idea that I wanted to treat it like a business and not as a hobby. I think that was, I think for a lot of gym guys, and maybe you've seen this in your space, you probably do, mm -hmm. um, where people get fired up. You know, they like to work out, so they want to start a gym. And that's cool. Yep. 
But if they're starting it as a hobby or as something else and they have a full-time gig, that's where some of them have a challenging time. For me, I started it knowing that I needed to pay my bills and feed my family eventually with it. So from day one, I I treated it like a business. I think that was the biggest difference. Yeah. And tell me too about like, because... I'm guessing that when I don't know that much about CrossFit sure. or or how the CrossFit games even are like structured, how's that go? How that goes down? But like, did you essentially take me from kind of even you said before that you got this timed um, AMRAP sort of mentality? It hit you for the first time and you loved it. How do you go all the way from that moment to becoming the best at it? Yeah, I mean, I got introduced to CrossFit in like 2006, and at the time, I just I liked it because it put the clock and it added this level of competition. You could look back on some old school YouTube videos where I would challenge people from like in Florida where I did a workout, be like, hey bro, see if you can do this faster than seven minutes or whatever, and I'd film it. And it was just a nice way to kind of allow my competitive spirit that I had when I was in high school playing group sports. It allowed me to continue to do that through fitness. And so I I got in love with that. And then as the years went on, um, I won the 2008 CrossFit Games, which was, incredible but then after that you know probably my my favorite year was probably in 2014 or 13 i got back on the podium both those years and it was a cool testament to just trying to stay in the game as the sport elevated so when i got into it you know it was a couple hundred people competing by the time in 14 and 15 when i was competing you had an open event that's online with about three to four hundred thousand and then it narrows down so what happens is for a lot of years, I would compete in the open, which is like three to 400,000 people. Then it narrows down to like regional events. Yeah. And that's like whatever, top X amount in your region. Then from there, you go to the games. And then if you perform well enough, you can then go compete to represent your country in one more thing called the Invitational. Wow. So that was cool. And I did that for a lot of years. And it was, a, it was an amazing ride. And it taught me so much. Like I wish someone had pulled me aside in like 2011 oh yeah. and be like, hey man, all this stuff you go through from a Camp Pendleton triathlon to all these different, where you're pushing yourself mentally and physically, later on in life when your daughter gets diagnosed with leukemia, it's gonna come into play. I wish someone had told me that because like looking back on my competitive career, it wasn't the money and the fame and the sponsorships or whatever that I care about. It's the fact that when my back was really up against the wall, I had developed a set of skills through these competitions that really helped my wife and I. So that was really cool. Yeah. Not to totally go off on a tangent on no. your question, but. No, no, that's 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 amazing. And, and I want to get into that too. Like when did that diagnosis happen with your, also take me, sorry, take me to this. It's like, so you win the CrossFit games, right? Then, and, and tell me where I'm off or, or whatever yeah. here, <laughs> is then you say, I need to leverage this. I need to start opening some gyms. I need a business here. Uh, no, so I graduated from college, okay. and then I opened up my gym, and I won the CrossFit Games in like the same week. Got it, got it, got but it. But I had already committed so the two to that before. Hand in hand. Yep, and then the following year, I competed again, learned a lot from that experience. I ended up passing out for the first time in my life, and I learned a lot about that experience, about understanding was in my control versus out of my control. I had a lot of anxious energy, and I ended up just blacking out. I still performed okay later on once I woke up. But anyways, <laughs> yeah. I got married the following week, Got it. So that was a big deal. And then my wife and I were married in 2009. We had our first daughter in 2011. And then we had our son in 2014. But in 2011, as as we had my daughter, so the business was growing. We were growing internationally. Uh, Competing was at the highest point. And I had my daughter and I started asking myself, like, how am I going to try and balance these different things, but actually be good at them? And I was walking down the street one day with my daughter and my, my wife. And my wife asked me a question. I just looked at her and I said, like, I'm really sorry. Like, I wasn't paying attention to a single thing you just said to me. And it was at that moment that I realized I had been living two one foot in, one foot out. Like, I was walking with my daughter, pushing in the stroller, but I was really thinking about, you know, walking on my hands at the CrossFit Games. And that was being detrimental in my relationships, in our business, and even in my fitness because I was so focused on different things when I should have been focused on something else. And so that's when I started to think, man, well, I'm never more productive than when I'm AMRAPing. Yeah. What if I just AMRAP family time? Yeah. Like, what if I say, dude, I'm trying to get as many reps in as I can with my son when we go biking today, yeah. right? Or whatever. It, it's more of a metaphor, of course. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like, yeah. Much, yeah. Yeah. like, come <laughs> yeah. on, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. But, um, I got that. Okay. So <laughs> then 
Then when did the diagnosis happen with your daughter? Uh, 16. 2016. So she was, uh, so she was um, like four. She was, she was almost five when got she it. got diagnosed. And what's going on? Like business is good? Yeah, I mean, so this is January 20th, 2016. Yep. So we're coming up on, you know, almost a three-year anniversary, which is a, a big deal. Got it. Um, but, you know, business was booming. We had international locations, signed big corporate accounts. Things were going good. Yep. Um, competing was, was uh, I had just, I, 2014, I took third in the world. Yep. Um, I had just competed for Team USA. It was a big year, right? And I'm going into 2000, or excuse me, 2014, 2015, I decided that I couldn't keep up with it at all. So I went team instead yep. of individual. Yep. Going into 2016, life was still good, blah, blah, and then boom, um, we got the diagnosis. And that was, uh, without without exaggeration, a life-changing moment. And I, at the time, I put something on Instagram, actually. I, when the night she was diagnosed, it was like two in the morning, I was crying, and I put this post on Instagram just asking for, you know, thoughts, prayers. Like, I never really asked anything from anybody on social media, but yeah. this time I did, right? Yeah. Just send us some good vibes. Yeah. And I remember writing at the end, you know, life changed. And looking back on that now, I think I just wrote it because I think I felt like it was going to change, you know? Yeah. And I, it was, but now looking back on it, it changed so much, but not in the way that I thought, you know, yeah. it changed for the better. Like, I don't wish our experience on anybody and I, not even my worst enemy, which I don't have really any, but, yeah. but I learned so much about family, so much about, you know, perspective. Yeah. It, it really has changed everything since then. And like, what is, not to get too personal, but I just want to understand, like, does yeah. that process, like, was she sick and yeah. you took her in and you were doing tests and then it came back that that's what it was? Yeah. So, so basically when we talk about this, it's important that when you look back on it in hindsight, you, you'd say, Hey man, that might not have seemed right. You probably should have gone to the doctor earlier, mm -hmm. but when you're in it, you don't see it like that. So my sister had gotten married in September and my, my daughter was the flower girl. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't even walk down the aisle because her legs hurt so bad. Uh -huh. And at the time, we're like, man, it just doesn't seem right, mm -hmm. you know? She like fell, this was weird. She had always complained about leg pain. I remember talking to a lot of different doctors. He said, hey, it's probably growing pains. You know, buy a trampoline. So I bought a trampoline. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, do this. I, I did it. Yep. But it was like bad, you know? Like I would have to carry her all the time. And I thought at the moment, you know, you just, you don't think like, oh, my daughter's leukemia. Yeah. You're just like, oh, it's leg pain. She's yeah. four years old or whatever. Yeah. And so fast forward, you know, a month or two, and she started getting these really bad ear infections. And I remember we go to the doctor and the doctor says to me, hey, I'm just letting you know, this is the worst ear infection in my 40 years of our practice I've ever seen. I just was like, huh, yeah. that's really odd too. Like, yeah. like, like what worse? is she like, doing? Yeah. Like, yeah, f like worse, it yeah. wasn't like, ah, top 10. Yeah. And so then she started um, becoming really tired mm -hmm. and she would fall asleep at school. We're like, hmm. <laughs> but these were all like individual occurrences. Yeah. And so finally, um, she started bruising and that was when we we're like, okay, there's something really wrong. We went in for, um, to take her in and we went in for blood work. Cause I thought it was gonna be like an iron deficiency or something like that. Yep. And so we got a call back and some of you may be wondering who are listening, like, why wouldn't you go get blood work earlier? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's uncommon to poke young kids without having some type of justification. Mm -hmm. And in our pediatrician, we would go to them all the time. They just never thought this far, right? Yep. Like it, no one thinks about that. Yep. So we went there, we got the blood work and they called us and they said, hey, you need to go to the emergency room immediately. So we went to Stanford emergency room, Lucille Packard, they're the best hospital on the planet. I thank them every day of my life. They've yep. saved my daughter's life more times than I can count. Yep. And from that day, we were in the hospital for a long time. Got it. Jesus. And then tell me how like, you know, cause I'm guessing that would just like rock your entire world, <laughs> change your <laughs> <A little> whole <laughs> perspective. My, I guess what I want to understand is like, how did, go back to the point of saying that all of that struggle that you put yourself through and all that growth that you put yourself through is what prepared you for that. How did the two apply? Yeah, so I'll give you a great example. So the night my daughter was diagnosed, it was like one in the morning and it was me, my wife, my daughter, and my father-in-law happened to be like on his way back from San Francisco, so he stopped in. Yeah. And we were waiting on the news and so the doctor pulled me outside the room. And he, she's like, hey, you know, your daughter has leukemia. And so I started crying, I broke down a little bit. Yeah. And, and I don't mind talking about this because it doesn't make me less of a man that I was crying. Like, no, of like I mean, the crying. fact of the matter was, like this was super scary to me. Yeah. And so I go back inside, I was like, hey, Ashley, you know, we need to go talk privately. So I pulled her out, I told her, we were both kind of crying in the hallway. It was at that moment that later on I reflected on this. 
my wife, Ashley, she just took me and I almost feel like she like grabbed me by the neck and like put me up against the wall, but she didn't. Like she's, <laughs> she's like home there. She's like, listen, you get on the phone, you call all of our family, you tell them all that Ava has leukemia, yeah. but you also tell them there's not gonna be a, a, a tear shed or a negative thought when you walk in the room. So if you have a problem, go cry outside the room. But as soon as you walk in, you're positive, you're enthusiastic, we're gonna go crush this thing, let's get this thing together, let's go. And yeah. she walked right back in. I swear to God, it was like the best pump up speech I've ever heard in my entire yeah. life. Yeah. There was no hesitation, just like, hey look, yes, our daughter has leukemia, let's stay positive, let's stay focused, let's go crush it. Yeah. And I was like, fuck. I was like, hell yeah. yeah right? you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it was not as easy as it sounds, but yeah. So then after that, you know, we went through a lot of tough times. Mm -hmm. And you know, our daughter was taking the ICU. We've we've had emergency response teams come in, and we, we've we've had some heavy stuff. And every time, when we looked back at how we re, how we how we were taken through bad news and how we overcame it, yeah. it was because for a lot of years I would pass out in events, I would fail an event, mm -hmm. or I'd win an event, and I had to learn how to overcome that. Mm -hmm. But my wife also had to too because she was watching the guy she loves, you know, black out on an event. Yeah. And how did she overcome that? And so I had a, um, you know, a sports therapist that worked with me on my mindset, yep. and we would work all together. Yep. And I think that just played hugely when our back was really up against the wall. It taught us how to overcome things. And I talk about this a lot in the book about use, utilizing positive self talk, utilizing what's inside and outside your control, and yeah. all of those things. It just set us up for the best position. Yeah. But yeah, my wife fired me up that night. That's good. Oh yeah, dude. Man, I, I just I'm so fascinated by it. I'm so fascinated by the power of mindset. Oh, dude. You know, and I think that like number one, I, I wish it was taught in school at like a young age. That's one thing, like going back to the high school conversation of like can you even redirect people at such yeah. a young age? I think mindset can really work wonders for people and it's not something that we're taught or that most people even think is changeable, right? Um and I also am so fascinated by the idea of like forced uh, adversity or forced struggle or, you know, so that yeah. to toughen yourself for when the real day comes. We, 100%. It's not a mental thing that like where you went through. If you end up one day getting in some sort of physical challenge, you're prepared. If, you know, only because you've punished yourself when you didn't need to on your own terms. So what you just said is like the cornerstone of the AMRAP mentality in the book mm -hmm. is this whole idea that build hedges so that if you ever need to use them, you have them. Like yeah. when I look back at, at that night when she got diagnosed, I wrote an email to our staff. And I said, hey, look, effective immediately. I'm no longer this. You do this, you do that, blah, blah. And I, I put the company aside. I said, whether it's a month, a year, whatever, I'm, I'm fully focused on one thing, which is get my daughter well. Yeah. But I had the financial means through hard work. I had the business was at a point because of great people there. And again, hard work. Mm -hmm. And our relationships were strong because we spent a lot of time focusing on them. And that, that family support, the financial support, and obviously my physical fitness was appropriate, that it, it, it helped us overcome this challenging moment. Yep. And I would encourage anybody to use fitness as a phenomenal way to overcome adversity in a very small setting. You're on a run. It's crappy. I get it. You tell yourself it hurts, you stop. Yep. But instead, if you tell yourself it hurts, try and use positive self-talk, reframe it in your head. Hey, let's go a little bit farther. Let's focus on this technique. And as you overcome that, it's not a life and death situation, that's okay, but you're learning how to overcome slight small things of adversity. Yeah. And I think that's what was so beautiful about all my competition years. Yeah, man, that's incredible. So what's the, what's, what's the update on your daughter now? Oh yeah, I guess we gotta talk about that, right? <laughs> I mean, um, so leukemia diagnosis, obviously I wasn't very familiar with it. The night she was diagnosed, I read everything I could with, that was actually like published well, like, cause you gotta be really careful about course, the internet. Yeah. But uh, my daughter had a type of leukemia, it's called ALL. Mm -hmm. um, and we got really, um, we were really fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, the type of leukemia she had was treatable. And we are we, two and a half years of chemo. Mm -hmm. A lot of times being put to sleep, a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of crappy stuff. Yep. But long story short, after two and a half years, she's now in remission. She is now eight months post chemo. Yep. We go back once a month. And after five years, so like we have four and a half more years, and then she's technically considered cured. Amazing. So at this point, though, like no more chemo, no more steroids, no more of that. She's uh she's killing the game. Actually, yeah. on the way down here, I, uh, you know, I on the way down here, I was just kind of reflecting. I was looking through some pictures on my phone, 
And uh, I, I text my wife, I can show you later. Uh-huh. And it was a picture of me, my wife, my daughter in the hospital with our masks on the night she was diagnosed. And it was just super heavy for me to look. I actually started crying on the plane. Yeah. And I sent it to my wife and I wrote, I just wrote like, we're crushing it right now. Life's good. Because yeah. in, in retrospect, in perspective, you know, I think sometimes we go there and like, I land in LA today and it's raining and there's traffic. And, I'm, yeah. and a lot of people get upset. Yeah. But I look at that picture, I'm like, dude, life's good. Yeah. Like, there's all, you know what I mean? Changes your perspective. So true. So let me ask you this too. Like, you know, you said that it was all the preparation that you did before that even allowed you to handle this incredibly like trying time, right? Yeah. Now that you're sort of over the hump on that stuff, what did you learn from that experience? Because I'm guessing that was a whole nother learning. Yeah, I learned a lot about that. You know, a couple things I learned is families, like families, family. Yeah. Like, you know, the night... The, the you know we were in the hospital for uh, about three months um we we've been in and out of the hospital for like maybe three or four months over the last couple of years mm-hmm. but the first time we were there we were there for like a month and my family was there all the time and i'll just give you a story to like kind of make you one morning i woke up and we were having a really tough night and i go in the waiting room and my father-in-law is just waiting there it's like 5 30 in the morning i'm just looking i was like jeff what the hell are you doing here man like yeah. i'm like you know half asleep he just looks at me he's like jason where else would i be yeah. And I was like, fuck, I was like, I, he get, like, I get it now. Yeah. Like, like that's the power of family. And so it really made me closer to my family, mm-hmm. made all of us closer. Um, but what it also taught me is that just because I'm having a hard day, just because something is going wrong in my life doesn't mean that other people aren't having stuff going wrong in their life. And I shouldn't judge them. If someone loses their job to them, that could be the worst thing that's ever happened to them. Yeah. Who's to say it's better or worse than someone whose kid just got sick? Yeah. It's not, because to them, that's the worst thing. Yeah. And to them, that's a big deal. Yeah. And it's taught me to be more compassionate in that sense, that even though we all have our own stuff going on, as a group of friends, it's our responsibility to lift people up around us who are going through tough times. Because mm-hmm. you never know when you're gonna be in a tough time and you need to be lifted up. Mm-hmm. And no person's wrong is worse than somebody else's wrong, like hardship. It's all just relative based on their life experiences. Yeah. These are just a few things that, you know. No, it's true. Okay, well, I wanna get into how all of this and (laughs) the because i mean it's incredible what i love is like you have stacked sort of the lessons or the growth or the strengthening and the conditioning into now not only learning all these lessons and evolving into a really amazing dude but putting it into book form and sort of really honing in on this amrap mentality and you kind of touched on a little bit with like the bike rides with your son and stuff like that so how does that apply to your day-to-day life like yeah. what do you, it just means being more in the moment or it means getting the most out of a moment and then moving on what does it mean let's take skateboarding because yep. that's something you're more familiar with than for example when you're on a skateboard it takes the first step is you gotta know what what i like to talk about is like why are you doing something yep. so like why did you start a clothing company yep. if you don't have a strong why you're probably going to fail because eventually it will get hard yep. and in the crossfit games when i was competing at the highest level it got really hard but I needed to know why I was doing it because if you don't, and it's not instant, you'll you'll be able to just give up, yep. right? So why are you on the skateboard? Then when you're on the skateboard, you need to be focused. And if you're not, you could easily hit a rock and just fall, right? I'm sure you've seen it before. I know I have where you hit a little pebble. And oh, so yeah. it, it requires focus. Yep. And so that's the second step of the MRAP mentality is being focused. And I like to equate it to riding a bike where if you're on a bike and you're not focused, you're going to fall over. Yep. The next step is this idea of hard work, whether you're on a bike or skateboard, you're pedaling. And this idea that you're not gonna progress forward unless you're working hard. And like legitimate hard work and this earned confidence we talk about. Then we switch gears throughout our day. And just like on a bike where you switch the gear based on the terrain, you switch the gear based on what you're doing. Right now I'm podcasting with you. Earlier today, this morning, I was with the family, had some breakfast, jumped on a flight, uh, met up with some guys real quick, came here, and I'm going to go do a workout, then I'm going to get back on a flight. But I'm I'm segmenting the day. When I get home, I'm with the family. So basically, I'm switching gears throughout the day. So it's like 30 to two hour you know, segments, yep. right? Let's just say. Yep. And when you're doing it, you're doing it. Yep. And then after that, you reevaluate. So you have a why, you focus, you work hard, you switch gears throughout the day. Then every now and then, when life throws you a curveball, you reevaluate what those focuses are. Yep. are. Um, and a good example for me is like, I used to compete, I used to have these different focuses, but when Ava got sick, it was an easy decision to reevaluate and to remove that one focus yep. from my plate, right? Yep. And um, 
So that's kind of the AMRAP mentality is this idea that, you know, I used to be the guy who would be one foot in, one foot out. I mean, I, I go to dinner. I went to dinner last night with my wife and I can't tell you how many times I see more people on their phones and actually having conversation. And I'd make the argument, you know, are we more productive today? Are we more productive 50 years ago when we didn't have such easy distractions? Yep. And I think that if you want to be on your phone, you have work to do, go ahead and get it done. Like that's all good. Yeah. But if you're going to be with somebody, you're going to spend time with them, like spend time with them, yeah. you know, yeah. be present, be focused on what you're doing. Yeah. And I think you'll get a lot more out of it too. Yeah. yeah. So that's like the cornerstone of the mentality. And, and the book, by the way, um, you know, a lot of the reason why I did it is because I wanted to raise awareness. First off, I want to donate to pediatric cancer because my wife and I are huge, uh, you know, supporters of families going through pediatric cancer. But I also want to just raise awareness that when things are good, keep building that hedge up, yeah. build it up. Yeah. You know, I used to think you want to work hard for nice watches and cars, but now I want to work hard because God forbid anything ever happens to some of my family or my whatever, that's one less thing that I don't have to worry about. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of like irrelevance, yeah. neutral. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it's almost like this like mentality of like, the world's gonna beat you up anyway. I'd rather beat myself up yeah. on my own terms and then be prepared as opposed to just sort of wait around for what's gonna hit me and then deal with it as it comes. Yeah. You know? And this idea of getting comfortable with uncomfortable, I think it's really important. You know, I use yeah. I use cold plunges as a great example. Do you do that? Yeah. Every day? Uh I, my goal is to start every day, but like yeah. to be honest, like that's something that's hard for me. It's right? brutal. I just got a sauna put at my house and yeah. I wanna do cold and hot. And I wanna do it because I wanna start really I want to inspire myself to get in, get uncomfortable, and see what, how that's going to affect me for other things I do in my life. Like yeah. I'm thinking about doing a jujitsu competition at the end of this month because I like putting myself in these uncomfortable positions because yeah. they make me strive to overcome adversity and to learn about myself through the process. Yeah. So good. Do you have any way of tracking? Like I know on uh, in CrossFit, it's a sort of battle of how quick can you do these things. So like when you're talking about dinner with your wife, bike riding with your son, business meeting, do you have any way to track if you're getting more efficient or you can just kind of feel it yeah i think you could just feel it yep. and and it's something that's really hard you know i bring it up because it's something i work on mm -hmm. but i work on it daily and i'm at least aware of it i think the key thing is if someone's listening right now like okay i get what this guy's saying yep. be present be focused but you know i find myself getting distracted okay that's cool yeah. but at least you're aware enough to know that you got distracted yep. that's, that's the step key. one yeah. that's step one yeah you know step two is you, you know then start supporting yourself by removing things that you know are going to distract you yep. right phones this that and i think when you really you know start flowing it just comes organic you know when you start having good flowing conversations because you're not getting distracted by yourself at a restaurant yep. it's just beautiful and i think that's what i'm striving for every day yeah so cool and would you say the book is the book mainly like is it your story mixed with how to apply this stuff or how did you lay out the book it's it's mainly it's it's a little bit of stories yeah um, but it's it's basically like, here's this mentality. This mm -hmm. is what I've used in my life mm -hmm. to balance these different things. Um, here are some stories to back up each section, yep. you know, like the why, the focus, the whatever. Yep. And here here are some reader exercises that you could do to improve. I mean, that the goal of it when I sought out to write a book originally was to write a book about like working hard yeah. because I travel a lot. Um, before my daughter got sick, I was on the road probably 200 days a year at least. And I'd read these books in the bookstore and they wouldn't align with what I saw in my life, yeah. like of hard work. So I wanted to write that. Then when she got sick, it kind of re reshaped the way I wanted to write it. So yeah. my goal for anybody reading it should be that there shouldn't be any fluff. You should read and be like, this guy just wanted to write something about working hard, getting after it and having this mindset and for the right reason. That, yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. Where do you go from here? Like you've been through so much, you've achieved so much. It seems like life's good. Yeah, You're in a good spot. Where, what do you do from here? Well, I think the first step is to recognize that we're in a good spot. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I feel like I reached my potential in CrossFit. Um, I'm going to still compete in some stuff and do some jujitsu stuff, of course. But I feel like I reached my potential. Yeah. You know, like I told you, I have a regret in high school because I didn't reach my potential. Yeah. I don't regret anything in CrossFit because I feel like I reached my potential. Yeah. Now the question is, how do I reach my potential as a business owner, as a father, as a husband? Not today, not tomorrow, but like for the long term. Yeah. And I think that um, recognizing when it's good and embracing is an important thing. Because in life, I've always set these goals and then I would hit the goal and I wouldn't like celebrate it enough. I'd just be on to the next thing. Yeah. But I think it's important to sometimes reflect and be like, hey man, like we're doing all right. Like let's celebrate, but still be focused on something bigger. So I think, where do I go from here? I consistently try and grow the message of 
supporting families going through pediatric cancer. That's like a deep internal why for me. Yeah. I've seen some really bad stuff and I want to help them. Yeah. And I want to build a business that makes a big impact on people. Yeah. And all the while I have a great time doing it with my family. So good. You're really clear. Really clear on that. You know? It's really good. I don't, I don't, know, if, I don't know what else to say. It's I mean, good, man. That's something I would wish that I could give to everyone is like that clarity. And unfortunately, I think some of the clarity came through, or maybe fortunately, through yeah. struggle. And, yeah. and that gave you incredible clarity on who you're doing it for and what you're giving back to. But you're you're super clear on that. Do you do like speaking stuff too or, or no? I do some motivational speaking, but you know, I, I'm open to a lot more of it. Yeah. I think you'd be great at it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just think for me, I, I just, I, I, want, I want to reach my full potential. Yeah. And I think the way that we could get there is by being present, being focused and getting after it. I just want to share that message with more people yep. for the right reason. I never want to forget the struggles I've been through because it'll continuously remind me to be grateful for what I have. Because yeah. there's always going to be something five years from now, I'm going to maybe forget the ICU, yeah. right? I'm going to forget that. But I need to remind myself of that because it's only going to make that day seem so much more beautiful, you yeah, know? Yeah. And I think that's something that everybody could take away is they could look at their hardships because everybody's had them, yeah. right? Mine are just maybe different than yours. Who have, and just remind themselves, hey, like all's good. Yeah. And I think if you bring a positive atmosphere, if you bring this passion, excitement, it surrounds you and then all of a sudden you start elevating. Yeah. It's hard because I feel like a lot of times people go through hardship too and they carry it with them instead in a negative way. Yeah. And it's sort of like you start to gain this mentality of things aren't fair, the world's not fair, and, and that starts to skew your... Yeah, the world know. doesn't owe you anything. Yeah. Nothing. I mean, you got to get after it. And I think exercise is a great place to start. It really um, is. Hit me up if you want to start you know, doing some type of workouts. But uh, I got to come up to San Jose and go dude, through a couple uh, Yeah, we could talk. Sessions. we could talk more offline. I mean, I yeah. think, you know, if, if people are not regularly exercising, they're missing out on the single greatest... Uh, mindset tool you could possibly get yeah. because there's so much you could learn while you're doing it in your garage, in the gym, whatever it is. If you don't want to do it to look good, that's fine. If you don't want to do it, if you don't want to do it to be healthy, okay. But if you want to do it to perform better at your career, to perform better as a husband, as a father, at whoever, that's where I think fitness starts yeah. to play a big role. Yeah, I think. And let's correct me if I'm wrong because I'm obviously don't know much about the 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 fitness world, but like. And I think CrossFit has a lot of this in it, which is why people love it so much. But somebody should create a workout program that's based around building mindset more than building your body, right? Yeah. If that makes sense. Because I think that everyone thinks about like, oh, I don't need to work out. I'm fine with whatever. Yeah. But like you don't realize all of these other benefits that come with it. Yeah. That nobody really, everyone knows that works out, but nobody really advertises it, if that yeah. makes sense. I talk a little bit about it. I have an AMRAP mentality uh, Instagram account yeah. where I put up workouts almost every day. But I also talk about, hey guys, come in, hit this workout, but then take that mindset and shift into other things. Yeah. What are you learning today? How are you incorporating it? Yeah, that's and good. That, that kind of stuff. Um, okay, this is my big my big ender that I ask everyone. If you could go back in time, I always try to pick a, a moment. Let's say, I'm gonna go back to high school where like, you're just killing it. You know, like you're yeah. popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on the football team, but yeah. you, maybe in the back Building of your mind. Building up those Coors Light pyramids at my <laughs> friend's house. Exactly. <laughs> as popular as can be, but you maybe in the back of your head know you're not reaching that full potential or whatever. You're kind of slacking off on schoolwork. You could go back you get one minute in your own ear. What do you now, everything that you've been through, what do you tell yourself? I would tell myself, like, you have a lot of potential and you're not reaching it right now. Mm -hmm. You need to stop messing around with things that aren't taking you towards your goals and start identifying what your goals are and start working towards those. Mm -hmm. And if they're not in alignment with that, you need to exit those from your life. Mm -hmm. Partying all the time, doing this, doing that, they're not in alignment with where my goals are. And I think that's what I would have told myself. Where do you want to get to? How are we going to get there? And if they're not, if, if these things are distracting you from that singular focus, yeah. remove them from your life. Yep. Great. Where do people find you? The book is out, what will be now yesterday. Yeah. Uh, is that out everywhere? Where is that out? It's on Amazon. You can find it on Kindle. You can Great. find it on, uh, should be on iBooks as well. But if you could download the digital version, boom, grab that. Um, hard copies also on Amazon. Um, before all the pre-sale proceeds, mm -hmm. every penny of pre-sales went to um, an organization that we support called NIGU, mm -hmm. which is a pediatric cancer organization. Uh, moving forward, uh, a large percentage of the book will. So just mm -hmm. keep that in mind as you guys are doing it. Please share with your friends. You can find it on Amazon, it's called As Many Reps As Possible. And probably the best place to find me would either be, um, would probably be Instagram, Jason Kalipa. Mm -hmm. um, would love to, love to engage with you, hit me up. 
And is your podcast live? Yeah, and so we have two podcasts. One's called Business of Fitness, which is very niche. Okay. It's very like business and fitness oriented. Yep. And the other one's called AMRAP Mentality. Uh, we've had like uh, 12 episodes of that and we're looking to continue to build it and would love for you guys to check that out. We just interview interesting people about how they make the most out of every single minute. Great. There it is, man. I'm going to come up to San Jose and do some back squats. Bro, we'll get you on the podcast when you come up to San Jose. We'll do a back I'd squat I'd love too. to, man. Put on a couple pounds while I'm up there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. All right, man. We killed it. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.